Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the question and answer session to provide a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. Our next webinar is on April 24th, and that'll be Simple Tips for Writing Life Sketches and Family Tree. And that'll be with Catherine Grant. Unfortunately, due to an unexpected medical situation, not the virus, um, James Tanner's presentation previously scheduled for today had to be postponed. He's doing well and will recover soon, and we will let you know when his webinar is rescheduled. Today's webinar will be a little bit different. We'll be holding a live question and answer session with Catherine Grant. After years on the sidelines, Catherine began doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton, Utah, Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she is a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process, process improvement. Besides family history, she loves, loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and springtime. And if Catherine's ready, we'll turn the time over to her to answer questions from the audience. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat box and Catherine can address them as they come in. Questions should pertain to family search and should be of general interest rather than just about specific research problems. All right, Catherine, we'll turn the time over to you to answer questions. Great, Brian, thank you so much. I am so excited to be with everybody today. We tried these Q&As a couple of years ago and they went really well and seemed to be helpful. And I'm not sure why we hadn't done any recently. So while I'm really sorry to hear about uh, James and his medical situation, it's good that we have this opportunity to have this Q&A today. So I see there have been some questions coming in. Thank you very much. And before we start on the questions, I just wanted to to kind of reiterate the ground rules that um, Bryant shared with us. And that's regarding the type of questions that we'll be answering. So questions in general about family search, how to use uh, uh, any of the features, uh, merging different things like that. Also general questions about family history, like methods, how would you do such and such? The thing that we're trying to avoid is questions about specific research. And when I say that, what I mean is, for example, asking how do I do a merge is an example of a, of a helpful family search question that would be useful to all audience members. Although, on the other hand, if someone said, well, I'm trying to find James Brown, he's my fifth great grandfather who was adopted as a child, and could we walk through how to, how to find that and actually do the research? That's not what we'll be doing in this call today, but questions about general um, procedures and how to do things or what would you do in such and such a circumstance, those would be valuable questions to everybody, I think. So we will proceed uh, with that in mind. And then if we run out of questions, I do have a couple of other suggestions, but the way it's looking, we may have plenty of questions to keep going. And we'll just keep going as long as there's interest and as long as there's questions. Well, within reason, right? We won't keep you here till midnight or anything. So our first question that I see here is from Terrell Mills. And thank you, Terrell, for, for your kind words. And you, your, your question is, do you hear anything, do you hear about anything that will help in resolving the numerous English duplicates? And that is such a good question. Because for those of you who may not be as familiar with English research, back in the late 20th century, there was a, or kind of mid to late 20th century, there was a lot of extraction done in English records. And in case you're not familiar with extraction, that's actually the old version of indexing. And when those names were extracted or indexed, as we would call it, they were given to the temple for people to do 
the family names. And every name that was extracted was always extracted twice, kind of as a double check. What was supposed to happen is that, okay, so extractor one would extract the name, extractor two would extract the same name, and then they had a person that they called an arbitrator who would look at the two records, make sure they were the same, or if they weren't the same, they would try and resolve them to see, you know, which one was correct. So, but a lot of times the either... I'm not, not sure exactly why, but for whatever reason, double records got entered in family search anyway for extraction, even though the arbitrators in theory were, were supposed to resolve those. So you will see a lot of uh, duplicate records for certain time periods in certain places in England. So to Terrell's question, how about resolving those? What Family Search has done is they've really refined their duplicate algorithms, or in other words, their uh, function that looks for duplicates. It's the extracted records are actually one of the best caught duplicates, if I could put it that way. In other words, if there is a duplicate on an, on an English extracted record, most likely it's going to show up on the page there, on the person page over on the right-hand side. So that's one way you can do it. Another way, Terrell, I don't know if, if you or if other people were able to attend last week's webinar on a website called Tree Sweeper. And Tree Sweeper will help you find duplicates, not just one at a time. So in Family Tree, the only way I'm aware of at least to find duplicates is to go to the person's page and see if there's a duplicate flag on the page, you know, over on the right, so right side where it says possible duplicates. Well, let me rephrase that. That's not the only way to find duplicates. That's the way to find what Family Search has identified as a duplicate. You can actually do a manual search just using the find function and find duplicates manually that way. But I think Terrell's question was more on, you know, what, what will help us resolve these duplicates. So the uh, family search possible duplicates function is one. Then tree sweeper is another. And the webinar recording from last week has been posted. And so if you go to our BYU Family History Library webinar page, just look for the webinar on Tree Sweeper, and it will give you instructions for using Tree Sweeper to find duplicates on more than one person at a time. So, Terrell, I hope that helps, and thank you so much for that question. So now let's move on to Kathy's excellent question. She noted that people's names sometimes change. That can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, for women in, in Western cultures, it happens when they marry. Most women will change their maiden surname, but it, it can also happen if people are adopted. Also, I had it happen on my line just because my great, great, great grandfather, I think he was third grade. Anyway, he just wanted to change his name. After his brother died, he adopted his brother's name as his first name. And so there can be many reasons for a name change. So Kathy's question is, what do you do in a case like that? Like, what name do you use in family search? So there's not a hard and fast rule, Kathy. That's a really good question. What I usually try to do, and I think this is actually recommended in, in Family Search Help, if I remember correctly, is to use the legal name. Now, what if they had two legal names? They were born under one name, and then they changed it legally to another What I'll try to do is use the name that they were most known by. So for instance, if they were born under a certain name, but then at age three, they were adopted and they always went by the other name, then I would enter that name in the vital section in the person page of Family Tree. But then the cool thing is, if you go to the other section, in fact, oh my goodness. Okay, let me see if this works, you guys. I actually brought up Family Tree just in case we needed to look at it, but I'm not sure I shared my screen to include it. So I am now showing Family Tree, but do you guys see it or do you see my old slide presentation? Can somebody uh, put that in the chat? 
Okay, so you do see family tree, Rindy, thank you. So I, we're looking at this uh, page of Cuthbert Berkeley or Barkley. And if I scroll down here, suppose that he had a different name that he went to, went by maybe Cuthbert Wells or something. Then what I could do is put the lesser used name here in other information. And I would just click add information and choose alternate name. And then I could choose, you know, also known as or a birth name or a married name or a nickname. And then you'd put the name in these fields here. And then also for sure, put a reason statement so that uh, somebody who comes along knows why you are listing this. This is an alternate name. Is it because they were adopted? Is it just because they chose that name? They like it, liked it and changed it partway through their life or whatever. So that would be the way that I would recommend listing an alternate name. But I would put in this uh, top section here, the vital section, I would definitely put the name that's either the legal name or the name that they most often went by. So Kathy, I hope that helps. I hope that answers your question. But if not, please feel free to post a follow up in the chat. Oh, and to answer your question about if your father was born with a certain name, but then switched to, or he was born with a name, but his father switched names, it would depend on if your father legally adopted the new name or not. And so a lot of times, you know, it's just family history is not black and white. There's so many shades of gray. And in the final analysis, as long as you make it clear on the person page that they went by both names, and sometimes you can even feel from the other side what they would prefer. And so I would say just do your best to uh, adequately identify the person with the names that they used and whether, which one you put in vitals and which one you put in other information, it, it's just pretty much up to you. But again, consider what was their legal name and what did they use the most. So thanks again, Kathy. Great question. So let's go to Bruce's in here. He says, when you get to the point when you, where you have exhausted your search for records in the standard databases, such as Family Search, Ancestry, Find My Past, My Heritage, and Janae in other words, all the Family Search partners, what's your approach for looking further? Do you try Family Search's guided research or research or some other databases and their client helpers? And that is also a fantastic uh, question because eventually a lot of us on certain lines will get to the point where we've got to look someplace else besides the standard records. So one thing that you could try besides these standard websites is a very, <laughs> very old fashioned approach which is to contact the government jurisdiction. So in the United States, that might be a county courthouse or in other countries that I'm sure they have equivalents of that where there's some record keepers that have kept paper records or book records or whatever, they're maybe not digitized. And in fact, I remember hearing someplace that still a large percentage of the world's records have not been digitized yet. So for you to, to check out those other archives could potentially be very helpful. And Bruce mentions Family Search's guided research, which is available on their wiki. And I love those. I would actually strongly recommend those. And then also, let's suppose that you were looking for additional records, let's say in Lincolnshire, England. If you go to the Family Search wiki and you search for Lincolnshire, England, or whatever place you're interested in, most of the time, you'll come up with a, a page that will list a bunch of additional resources. So those are two ideas to uh, look for further records beyond just the, the five major digital sites. Bruce, thank you so much. Wayne asks, has the merge feature changed? And it does, it has changed just recently. So 
let me ask you to respond in the chat, everybody. Would you like to walk through how the new merge feature works? Because if you would, as it happens, Cuthbert has a duplicate here. So we could actually, oh, I have to scroll up to see it. So we could actually walk through doing this duplicate merge for Cuthbert if the audience is interested in doing that. So I'll give you, give you a chance to uh, respond on that, but let's go to another question here. Kathy asks, why are there two numbers for films in the Family History Library catalog? And if you're citing a film, which one do you use? I do not know the answer to that question. So could I turn that back to the audience? If anybody knows the answer to that, could you please put it in the chat? Because I would love to learn that. I've noticed those two numbers, but I've never known why they were there or really what to do about it. So thank you. Okay, Helen Louise Colwell, I love that name, Helen Louise, has a question, how important is it to use the standard format when entering dates, names, and places in Family Tree? Today, for instance, the computer was searching for India instead of Indiana. A contrib contributor had entered a place as IND instead of Indiana. So that is a really, really helpful question. The answer to that is it is super important to use standards, the family search standards, because that's how family search finds record hints for people. It's about how they find duplicates. And yes, we can override the standards, but it just makes the computer not work as well. It makes the web searches not work as well when we don't enter in the standard. So if somebody is wondering what we're talking about when we say standards, let me just show really quickly. So right here, we've got a 31 JUL 1824 on Cuthbert. But the correct standard is to write out the, the month completely and not to capitalize it. So, and in this case, honestly, that is not going to make a big difference to the search engine. But if you have over here, like Helen said, if you have IND and the system thinks it's India instead of Indiana, that's, that's a problem. So to standardize a date, it's actually really easy. You just click edit by the item that you want to standardize. And you notice that Family Search has guessed that this should really be standardized as 31 July 1824. So it went ahead and entered the standard date in. But if it hadn't, what you do is click right after the end of the date and just hit your space bar. And when you do, a list of possible standards drops down. Now for the date, there's only one, but often for place names, there'll be more than one standard to pick from. But you just go ahead and click the standard that you want, and then you go ahead and click Save. Now, of course, I would want to put a reason statement in here, but right now, I don't know where this information came from. So for now, I'm going to just save it without a reason statement. But once I've got some good proof, I want to come back and put that reason statement in. So it is super important to use the standard. I'd he I've heard of people, you know, either skipping it or putting in their own things. And of course, everybody is welcome to do that, but just be aware that when you do, the duplicate algorithms and the hint algorithms and so forth don't work as well, and you may make it harder for another researcher to find this record or to um, find records of you know, additional information about it. So Helen, thank you so much. So Peter's question, as we scroll down here, I see a lot of people are interested in the merge. Oh, Carla points out a good point here about standardization. There are times when you will be blocked from doing temple work if the records are not standardized. My understanding is it's not in every case like that, um, just that date being Jewel instead of July. I believe that would not have blocked temple work, but if the place name is way off or you know the birth name birth date got standard or didn't get standardized and it was 0011 or something weird like that then I understand that temple uh, ordinances can't be reserved until those are resolved so thanks Carla for reminding us about that Okay, we've got a question from Peter. Has Family Search considered using moderators to resolve disputes on family trees? I've been told that they have considered it. I've 
I'm not heard that they've made a decision on that. So that might actually be a question to ask on the Get Satisfaction Family Search Forum. And the way to get to that, as I recall, I actually haven't tried this for a while, but let's give it a shot. I believe that you click on Feedback, and then you say that you have a suggestion or a compliment, and you say Share Your Idea, and I believe it's going to take us, yes, it did. It took us to this wonderful site called Get Satisfaction, where just any user of Family Tree can ask a question, uh, make an observation, make a suggestion, whatever. So this is a great place to, uh, to raise that, Peter. And what I love about this site is that Family Search employees monitor it all the time. So you will get somebody's attention if you post something here. And I just want to give a shout out to Family Search on this. They have been so incredibly responsive, especially, I'll be honest with you, sometimes people get pretty abusive on this site, and it's disappointing, and, and you know, they do try to, I believe this site does have moderators, and so they, they do try to keep people being kind and respectful. But I just want to point out that Family Search employees really, really are trying hard to give us a good product. So if you post something here, give them the benefit of the doubt and, and, and know that they're trying their best to, uh, to, let me close that. I don't know if you saw that. I just got a message. Um, but give, know that they are doing their best to provide us with great solutions for family history. And so write any suggestions or concerns with that in mind. And most of the time you will get some kind of an answer from a family search employee. Plus a lot of times other users will chime in and I learn a lot of interesting things on this site. So once again, how you get here is just scroll to the bottom of any person page or actually pretty much any page on familysearch.org and look for this feedback link click the feedback link and don't visit the help center to get to get satisfaction. That's a different area, but just choose suggestion or compliment and then choose share your idea and you'll get taken over there. Okay. Let's see. Question from Cassandra. What do you do when you're, you find your tree put up by you and it is showing information for living people? So, Cassandra, I'm not sure, would, maybe you could ex elaborate a little bit on that. I, I'm not understanding for sure what the problem is. I, I'm hearing you say, or I'm reading you say, that you've got a tree and it's showing living people. And, and help me understand why that is causing an issue. Is it because other people can't see your living people? If so, we can talk more about that. So... I think we are to the point, oh, let's see, use alternate information. If you have a child that marries a same-sex person, how do you enter that information? That is a very good question. Family Search has recently um, implemented same-sex couples in Family Search. So you would just add a spouse, like suppose that Cuthbert was in a same-sex relationship, then we would just add his spouse who would already either already be in here with the with the right gender, or you would add them with the right gender, and then they would show in the system as a same-sex couple. So Nick, if that uh, doesn't answer your question, if you need more detail on that, let me know. Thank you. So I think we're down to the point where everybody is saying that they would like to see the new merge process. And yeah, it's, it's um, quite a bit different from the previous process. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We're gonna come up here to Cuthbert and we are going to click on possible duplicate and we're going to click review merge. So the new process, there's a, a few different things about it. One is the look and feel of it. Another is that in the old process, the person that you were going to keep, sometimes called the surviving person, was on the left, and the person who was going to be archived was on the right. Now they're flip-flopped. 
So just keep in mind that this is the person who is a possible duplicate and who is going to be archived at the end of the merge. The word deleted is not quite accurate because the record is never really deleted. It's still in the system. It just doesn't come up after the merge. It doesn't come up unless you know the PID or if you look in the change log and then you click on it that way, you can bring them up as well. So that's one difference is that they're on the other side. The other difference is that FamilySearch has tried to kind of slow people down a little bit when doing merges, which is a wonderful thing because in my experience, bad merges are one of the biggest contributors to problems on Family Tree. So they've, they've divided it into three steps. In the first step, they ask you to just look at this, this, these two people and decide, are they really a match or not? So for instance, in Cuthbert's example, we look here and we see that uh, the guy on the left was christened on the 22nd of August in 1824. He has no birth date. The guy on the right was born on the 31st of July, 1824, same place, but has no christening date. Could they be the same person? It's actually looking pretty likely. Do we have absolute proof? Not really, because we don't have two dates that are exactly the same. As we look down here for the parents, ah, this is looking good. We've got a Charles Barkley for the dad, and we've got a Margaret McCorick, I guess, for the mom. Those are two rather unusual names. And so that's kind of adding to the evidence that these people are the same. The surviving record, the one we're going to keep, has a lot of siblings, whereas the one that we're wanting to merge in has no siblings. But that's probably not a deal breaker for this merge. So we scroll down and we see that, interestingly enough, the person with less information has a source and the person with more information doesn't have a source. So I want to make a comment here on this first merge screen. It's absolutely better if you're not certain they're the same person to cancel the merge. It causes so many problems to merge two people that shouldn't have been merged that I would say if there's any doubt in your mind that these two people are the same, I would cancel the merge, I would check it out, and then come back and, and if you need to do the merge, do it. So what I want to do in this case is I think they're probably the same because of the close christening and birth dates and the parents' names, but I want to find a record that's going to prove to me that the guy who was born on this date in this place is the same guy who was christened on this date in this place. In other words, I want to find a record that has both those items on it so I know that he's the same person. Now, are you always going to be able to find a record? No, not always. So in those cases, if the evidence is pretty substantial as it is in this case that it's the same guy because again exactly same place close dates for birth and christening and the same parents then I don't think that's a bad thing to merge those people but a lot of times you'll get to this comparison screen and you will discover that there's not enough information to make a determination and if that's the case for sure we want to cancel the merge. Now the new interface in my mind is a little bit confusing on how you cancel a merge. It actually used to say cancel, but now it doesn't. We don't want to say continue because we're, we're going to check it out first. We don't want to say not a match because they might be a match. And if we mark them not a match, that will uh, not it'll make it so I'll have to go into a different place to find him again and start the merge over so I don't want to do that back is what you hit to in effect cancel the merge so that's what we're doing so we've come back here to Cuthbert's person page and what I want to do here is do a search for a christening record. And you remember that Cuthbert, this duplicate, actually had a source. He had one source, which was a christening record. So we're going to just hop over to his page really quickly. I'm going to click on his name instead of review merge because I want to go to his person page. And we're going to look at the source. 
So we've got Scotland births and baptisms, and I'm going to say view source to look at more detail. And as I look at this, well, it doesn't have the birth. It only has the christening. And so this has not proven anything for me, but there's one other thing that I want to try quickly. And that is, okay, on my screen, I'm sure this isn't showing for you, but on my screen, this is blocking my tabs. <laughs> so I can't, I can't close the tab, how funny. Let me try and put that down. And now I'm gonna close this tab. And then what we wanna do, this is actually one of my very favorite features of Family Search, Family Tree. And that is these, what I call logo searches over here. Anytime you click one of these logos, it's going to take the information on the person page and it's going to run a search for you. You don't even have to type anything in. I love this. It makes it so convenient and so quick and easy to search. So in this case, I'm going to try Ancestry this time to look for a record that might have both the christening and the birth date on it. So I click the Ancestry logo, and we come over here, and we've got, oh, it wants me to sign in. And I promise you I was signed in. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I was signed in before. Now we'll go back to the search, or maybe we'll just hit the back button. Okay, there we go. I'm going to refresh, see if that will... Okay, there we go. You notice the reason I did that, you guys, I should have pointed that out. I apologize. It wasn't actually showing the dates. It was showing placeholders. And normally it only does that if you're not signed in. But now we're seeing the information that we need. So I'm going to hover over this. Well, this one only has a baptism date too. I'm going to hover over this one. Aha. Do you see that? This record includes both the birth date and the baptism date. And they are what we saw on those two records. So now, oh, and the parents' names match. So now we have the proof that we needed that these two people really are the same person. And I wanted to show you that for two reasons. One is that it is so surprisingly simple these days to do this quick kind of sanity checking. It used to be that research was difficult and time consuming. You'd have to go to a library or you'd have to write to a county courthouse. So doing quote unquote research got a really bad reputation. But what we just did was research and that took us what, maybe three minutes to check that out, maybe four max. And so doing research in today's world is incredibly easy. And we just have information at our fingertips that helps us do this kind of sanity checking and make sure that our information in Family Tree is accurate. So we're going to go back over here and we're going to continue that merge. So I'm going to click Review Merge to go back into it. And now I'm comfortable that these are the same people and we already looked at the family, they match. So I, Family Search has given me the opportunity to just do a sanity check here, which I've done. And I do believe that these people are the same individual. So I'm going to click Yes, Continue. Now what happens is that Family Search will scoot over or move over to the surviving record at least three different things that I'm aware of, actually four, I apologize. It will move over all temple ordinances, so they always go to the surviving record. It will move over all memory. So photographs, uh, stories, and so forth will all automatically move over. Sources will also move over. But now, other information will automatically move over. So you see this time it moved over the christening for me, or when I say this time, I mean as compared to the old process. So in the new process, this christening date has moved over, the duplicate parents have moved over so that I don't have to scoot them over, and the sources have moved over too. So if, if by chance they had moved over anything that wasn't correct, then you've got this undo button over here. And then also, if you see any record that is better 
on the record that's going to be archived, then you can click replace and it will come over here to the surviving record. But in this case, um, I am not sure which name to use, to be honest. That actually goes back to Kathy's question, right? Because for cases like this on christening records, the clergyman just wrote what he heard. A lot of times the family either didn't know how to spell their name or didn't, um, they were illiterate or didn't care because spelling wasn't a big deal back then. So I, at this point, don't have any reason to prefer one name over the other. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave this name the way it is. But I could go back to that other information section and enter this one as an alternate name. So we look over this and we say, yes, birth is good, christening is good, parents are good, we are going to have to merge these duplicate parents, we're not going to do it in this webinar, but uh, just as a user, I would know, yes, I've got to go back and, and do that merging. We looked at the christening record and it applies, so we're going to keep that there and we're going to hit continue. Oh, I need to show you one thing. For those of you who have watched some of the other webinars that I've done on merging duplicates, I always like to include the names and the PIDs of both people being merged. So here we've got Cuthbert Barclay, Barclay, B-A-R-K-L-A-Y, and I'm going to copy his PID and I'll show you why in a minute. And you may have noticed that the little message no longer shows up above the PID when you copy. It shows up in the upper right hand corner of the screen. So the reason that I needed to copy this is that when I get to the last page, the two people don't show up anymore. I'm actually going to email Family Search and ask them to show the two people whether they will do that or not. I have no idea. But I feel that it's so helpful to have both people there just so that you know, you know, it's the last screen, granted, but we want to keep in mind who we're merging. So for this reason statement, I'm going to say Cuthbert Barclay, and then I'm going to paste in the PID and... Cuth, let me scoot the cursor out of the way. Cuthbert Berkeley, oops. And then I'm going to copy this PID over. We're born in the same location um, and have the same parents. In addition, he was christened shortly after he was born. And I probably, okay, you guys, I, I actually didn't plan this out ahead of time. So you're seeing what I would really do in real time. So I'd say he was christened shortly after he was born. What I'm trying to say here is that that's reasonable. So I could say he was christened shortly after he was born, which is typical um, for countries that practice infant baptism. And then, shoot, there was one other thing I was thinking of. Oh, it's the other record. So I'd say in addition, no, I've already said in addition. I could say also uh, one of his christening let's see Kristen ing records shows both the birth date and christening date so something like that and I don't, this is actually quite long for me for a reason statement. Usually I'll just try to make the maybe two or three points that let other people know why I felt this was a duplicate. But this one, I, you know, we want to put a little bit of extra information in there. So I'm going to say finish merge. And now he's merged. So having seen that, uh, that example of merging using the new system. If you have questions about that, go ahead and post them in the chat. And I'm going to bring the chat back up if I can figure out how to do that. Let's see, I think I have to go more chat. Okay, great. 
So let's see where. Um, Please show how to add the other resource. Oh, that is a great question. Okay, we'll do that. I want to answer some of these questions about, uh, or that are pertaining to the merge. So, Terrell is saying, please, everyone give feedback and suggest that the names and PIDs be displayed on the merges. So, yes, I agree. Give feedback, and the more people do it, the more Family Search realizes that this is valuable for users. And then Peter asks, can you highlight both names in one swipe, like we, one swipe like we used to? And Peter, we've tried that. I was working with a lady last night, and it's a lot harder than it used to be. And so I've ended up just kind of typing them instead now, instead of trying to copy them like we used to be able to. So that might be good feedback to give. In fact, I can show you if you want why it's kind of a pain because we've got some duplicate parents here. Oh my goodness, that's interesting. Whoever made that comment that um, Charles's parents both say Barkley, even though his own name was spelled differently. So for that reason, I would probably be inclined to go in and change this to the name that matches the parents' names. So let's go ahead and just look really quickly at what, oh shoot, now I've forgotten, was it Peter or who made that comment about um, that it's harder to copy now or asking if we could copy? So I'm, oh, I thought he was gonna show up as a duplicate. He did not, let's go back here. We're gonna grab this PID. See here it does the old way of copying the PID. And personally, I think that's a lot more user friendly. So that could be feedback to give family search as well. So I'm gonna copy that PID and then I'm gonna come back over here to the other Charles, the other dad. And because the possible duplicate isn't showing up quickly right here, you know, it's, I just noticed there's 12 items and so he probably is on the big screen but I'm going to just come down here because now I've grabbed the PID and I'm going to say merge by PID or merge by ID and I'm going to paste this in and come here and so to get to the next screen this is the place where you could try and copy them but now we had a hard time last night when I was working with my friend see it doesn't grab the PID so but it does grab deceased and it was just yeah if you're really careful with your mouse you can probably grab the name yeah we just got the name right there but you can't grab the PID at the same time so what I have been opting to do is just grab this PID and remember the name and then when I get over to the final screen for the reason statement I go ahead and paste in the PID and type the names. So it's kind of a kind of a hack, kind of a workaround. But anyway, that that has been the best way I've found to do it in the new process. So let's go ahead and get out of this merge because I'm actually not ready to do this one yet. And we will go back to questions. You guys, these are such good questions. I have to tell you how much I appreciate what everybody is asking. Because I can guarantee you that if you ask a question, probably at least half or more of the audience has the same question. OK, Charles Barkley should show up in several English censuses. That is true. Charles. The dad, if he lived to 1841, he will, and he did. He lived until 1865, according to this. So he should show up in three English censuses, 41, 51, and 61. And then also the son, Charles, or Cuthbert, excuse me. The son, Cuthbert, is going to show up in the 41, well, if assuming, again, that he lived to 41, he'll show up in that and as many censuses for how, as long as he lived. So that would be a great way to find his name and to see what name the family usually used. So, Terrell, thank you for that great suggestion. Hayden, good observation. Nine duplicates. I'm guessing those are parents on extracted christening records. So let's see, Paul, I haven't forgotten your excellent question about how you add that other source. And I just want to scroll up a little bit and make sure that I've gotten all the other um, questions that people had. 
So after Terrell says, after adding sources, go back and click edit on birth to see what sources. Oh my goodness, that is a great suggestion. For those of you who may not have seen how that works, let's go into this right here. Well, we're on the dad. Let's go to Cuthbert because I'm not sure that the dad has tagged sources, but Cuthbert should. So let's go back over to our buddy Cuthbert. And you notice on the, okay, here, well, you know what? We're gonna have to tag it anyway. I'm so glad that you brought that up, Terrell. So you notice here that the birth has zero sources and the christening has zero sources. And yet, when we come over here, there is a source and it is for the christening. Or in Scotland and England, at least, infant christenings were, well, okay, a christening is not technically the same as a, an infant baptism, but in the, the tech te terminology that we use as family search users and as members of the church very often, we treat them as the same thing. And they're, so they're pretty much synonymous. But I understand, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but that a christening is actually the giving of a name, whereas the baptism is the performance of the ordinance of the, um, I guess it would be called an ordinance, right? It would be, in this case, sprinkling the infant with the water that was done by the clergyman. So we've got a baptism record here here. And it does indeed show the christening. The reason that it's not showing up when we look at the christening date is that nobody has tagged it yet to say that it's about the christening. So we want to click tag right here. And we want to say, we want to check off everything that it provides evidence of. So it does give the name. Now I don't remember, did it give the, the sex? Yes, it does. It tells that he's a male. So we're going to click sex there. We're going to say it does give evidence of birth because even though the birth is not listed on this particular index of the record, children were typically, like almost always, christened as infants. So the christening date usually is a pretty good indication of the birth. So we're going to click christening on that as well now. And now when we tag it and we come back, to the details section over here. Now notice that there's one source for the birth and one source for the christening. So now if I click edit, that source that we just tagged shows up over here as relevant to this information. So thank you, Terrell. That was a very great suggestion to, to have us look at that. Okay, next, I keep having, I don't think you guys can see the chat window. I think it just shows up for me. I keep having to close it and then reopen it so that I can see what's going on on, on the family tree screen. Okay, so uh, Hayden asks if they've changed the possible duplicates on the mobile app as well. Hayden, I don't know the answer to that. I have not looked at possible duplicates on the app since I noticed they changed it in tree. Does anybody know? If you do, please post it in the chat. Okay, Paul says, how can you add that new source? So I think we're to that point. My favorite, so there's two ways to do that. My favorite way to do it is actually to use a browser extension called RecordSeq. So I will show you that, but first let me show you the manual way in case you don't want to, to deal with browser extensions. What you would do is come to sources. I'm trying to remember here because I have, actually haven't done this for a while. And then you would click add source. And you would do add a new source because we wanted to add it from Ancestry. And then you get this form and you just fill out all the information, put in the, the URL from Ancestry. And then when you're done, of course, do a reason statement, tag the source. And then when you fill it out, you will, the blue, the save button will be blue and you'll be able to click that. So I did, went through that a little bit quickly. I apologize. Um, if you if that was confusing at all, we've got some webinars on adding sources and also you can rewatch this recording. So that would be how you do a source manually. If you'd rather use the browser extension called RecordSeq, here's how to get to that. So we I'm going to open up a new tab here. 
if I can do that. My uh, Zoom controls are blocking it, so I'm going to have to come down here, open a new tab, and I'm going to say recordseek.com, and I'm going to that site. So this is a free site that just offers a browser extension that will grab pretty much any information off a genealogical web page. Doesn't matter if it's ancestry or find a grave or anything. It will do its best to grab the information off and put it in a source. It is really awesome. So what you do is just go down here and choose whichever browser you use and then follow the steps. It will walk you through installing it on the browser. Or if you've got your, um, shoot, I think it's called a bookmark bar. Yeah, if you've got your bookmark bar showing, you can actually drag this button up to the bookmark bar and then just drop it. It's not gonna let me drop it because I already have Record Seek installed. Uh, but if you didn't, you should be able to drop it there. So you can either drag and drop or choose one of the browser extensions, uh, one of the browser icons and follow the prompts that you'll get. So my icon shows up like this, and I've seen it actually, if I recall, it looked slightly different on a different system. But if you hover over it, you'll be able to see which one is Record Seek. So now that it's installed, it will show up no matter what page you're on. So we want to go back to Ancestry and find that record that had both the christening and the birth date. So I'm going to click on that. And here we go. So you notice that uh, Record Seek is showing up here. So I'm just going to hit Record Seek, the icon. I click that. And it says, hey, you're, you apparently want to create a source. Do you want to attach it to Family Search or attach it to Ancestry? This could be a little confusing because you might think that you're adding it from Ancestry, but these two logos mean where do you want to attach it to? So Record Seek will only attach to Family Search or to Ancestry. And in this case, we want to attach it to Family Search. So I'm going to click Family Search. And look what it does. It just grabs all the information off that page and plugs it in. How cool is that? I love this, this add-in. I use it all the time, honestly, for sources that are not in Family Search Historical Records. For sources in Family Search Historical Records, it's actually easier to use the Family Search, Family Search Source Linker. But for anything else, this is really an awesome way to create a source. And you notice they've already tagged it to the thing that they think it applies to. And I no, we know that it applies also to name, gender, and christening. So I'm going to go ahead and tag that, and those tags will be added to Family Tree. So I'll hit close there. And the one thing I've noticed lately is that there has been a bug sometimes where the URL doesn't cop copy over correctly. So I'm this ends in 60143. I'm going to go over here and see if this one ends in 60143. Well, it's actually got, you notice, here's 60143 right there, but it's got a bunch of other stuff too. So what I want to do is see, does this record work without the other stuff? Okay, and I'm sorry, this is just for my own curiosity. You absolutely do not have to do this, but I wanna see if this is going to work. And it's not. So that uh, URL over there that got stuck in Record Seek actually is not going to work. And so what we've got to do in this case, I just hit my back button and I'm going to click in here. And you notice that the whole URL is selected. So then I'm going to hit Control C for copy, but you could also right click and choose copy. And then I want to switch back over to Record Seek. I want to erase this URL because we saw that that did not work. And I'm going to paste in the one that I just copied. So again, if this seems a little bit 
you know, you, you might be saying, oh, I'm not getting that. Can you slow down? And I would say we're almost out of time. So unfortunately, I can't slow down, but you can watch the recording. So we are now going to hit next. Oh, and what I will normally do for describe the record is I will come back here and I will grab Ancestry's description. So I will select that, hit copy, come back over here, and I will say description from ancestry.com. And I will paste in that description and then I'll hit next. And then you can search for the person that you want to, want to attach this to, but honestly, it's so much easier to just grab the, the PID. So I come back over here. Let me make sure this is not the deleted person. Yeah, this is the right one. So I'm going to click here, copy that PID, and then I'm going to go back to Record Seek. I'm going to paste it in here. So I did Control V, but you could just as easily do or excuse me, right click and choose paste. And then I click next. And then I want a reason statement. And this is actually another really cool um, browser extension. We've got a whole webinar on this if you're interested on attaching sources. So this is simple fill. And I'm going to add a christening reason statement. So this provides evidence of the christening date and location along with parents' names. Remember, this adds the birth date too. So I'm going to say evidence of christening date. Well, actually, let me do birth date. Birth date, uh, I guess that's supposed to be two words there. Okay, birth date, christening date, and uh, location. So I had to edit it a little bit, but that's okay. Provides evidence of birth date, christening date, location. Probably I should say christening location and parents' names. So now this recent statement will be transferred over to Family Search. So I'm going to click Create and Attach. And it says, Congratulations, the source has been attached. So now I can close this. But what's up with this? We still have one source. Well, the reason for that is that the page does not know to, re to refresh automatically. So I just need to click Refresh. And now notice there's two sources. The other thing that RecordSeq doesn't do is send the date over. So anytime you add a source using RecordSeq, you want to come here and click Add, and you want to add the correct date. So we know it's 1824, and we just put the date in, and we click Save. And now Cuthbert has his two sources. So thank you very much for asking that. And let's go back to the chat and see where I know we're getting close to the end. Uh, Bryant, stop me if we can't, if we need to stop addressing questions. But I'm going to see if there's anything that we, let me just scroll up here a little bit, make sure I've gotten everything. Okay. With the current interest in DNA, how should we record DNA information? That is a really, really good question. There, as far as I know, there aren't standards for that. So probably what I would tend to do is create a memory for it. I'd come over here to memories and I'd probably either put it in a separate document and upload it, you know, that's probably what I'd do. I'd probably for now put it in a document. I was going to say story, but the purpose of story really is a story. It's not so much documentation. So I probably would, you know, make a PDF or a Word document and change it to PDF for something and upload it that way. Great question. Kathy asks, I want to add my grandfather to family search, but I have no birth certificate. And now I'm trying to scroll down and it's not letting me. Okay, I want to add my grandfather to family search, but I have no birth certificate. Kathy, that's a common concern. I'm so glad that you raised that. So there will be cases when you don't have access to a birth certificate, no matter how hard you search. 
hopefully you'll be able to use other records to estimate the person's birth date and birthplace. So for example, if they lived in a country in a time period with a census, what I would do is check a few censuses just to make sure they agree and then use that birthplace and also that approximate birth date. And in Family Tree, you can actually type the word about for a date. Let me just get back over here real quickly and show you. I won't save this change, but suppose we didn't know Cuthbert's date and we just knew it was about 1824. If I type about 1824, whoops, that's an example of a bad date, right? About 1824, notice that that's an acceptable standard. So to say about is acceptable for family search and it's a good way of letting other users know that you did estimate this information. So I'm going to cancel that. I do not want to save that. So Peter writes, the problem with record seek is that you may not be able to see the original document. Is there a workaround for this or should you use memories as a source? Oh, Peter, thank you for bringing that up. That's absolutely right. If this is on any kind of a fee based site or possibly, you know, the site shuts down or something and it's no longer available, then yeah, that link will not work. So that is one risk with using record seek. And so for that reason, then it really is a good idea to take a screenshot of the item and upload it as a memory. So you would, and you can upload screenshots either as photos or documents. And when they're, when they're documents, you know, like when they're birth certificates and such, I tend to upload those as documents rather than photos. I try to keep photos for really images, pictures of people. So thank you very much, Peter. Okay. And I think that's it. I think we've addressed all the questions. So unless anybody has more, Bryant, we'll turn the time back over to you. Thanks oh, so Kathy. Oh, sorry. No, I just, Bryant, <laughs> thank you. I just noticed Kathy's very good comment that we've got to be careful of copyright there. So whatever site you're on, check the copyright terms and don't add any image that would violate a copyright. A lot of times you can get away with fair use because in, at least in the United States, because this is research, but I've noticed sometimes that people abuse fair use. They use it as a, a reason to just upload anything regardless of copyright, and that's not what it was intended for. So be careful there and just think if you owned that item, would you want somebody reposting it? That's, that's a good way to, to measure whether you're violating copyright. And Hayden, thank you. I'm glad you like these Q&As. And I think Bryant could answer that question, but my own feeling is I'd love to do more of these. Oh, Bryant, may I answer this last question from Cheryl really quickly? Yes, go for it. No problem. Okay, thank you. It will be really quick. So, um, I mean, not Cheryl that we have to rush through this. I just want you to know it, it is simple, and I think you'll like how easy it is. So what you do is when you go to the person where somebody has declared not a match and you click under research help, you click show all. When you get in there, there's going to be an area for dismissed helps. Nobody has dismissed anything for Cuthbert, but if they had, I would click on this and then it would say something like maybe a match and you would and it's over here and you would click the button maybe a match and then it would make it not be not be dismissed anymore. So great question. Thank you. And I think that's it. All right. Thank you everyone for all your questions and thanks Catherine for all the great answers as well. Uh, we can definitely do more of these um, question and answer sessions. It looks like they're pretty popular. I think we'd just like to remind everyone about our webinar upcoming next week on Friday, April 7th, or 8, April 24th. <laughs> and that'll be Simple Tricks for Writing, Life Sketches, and Family Tree. And that'll also be by Catherine. Um, and so make sure to join us for that. It'll be a great presentation. And Bryant, yep. can I, sorry, I saw one more question come through. So I would say anybody who wants to sign off could, if you've got other obligations that you need to get to, but is it okay if I answer Leela's question quickly? Yeah, go for it. 
Thank you. So, Alila, I hope I say, I'm saying your name right. I apologize if not. But you commented that when you used help others and added a person, it created a duplicate record. And I've actually had that happen as well because somebody else was adding a record on their own screen and then when I used help others it added it for that person as well so the only thing to do in that case is if you just barely added it and nobody has changed the record if you look on the right hand side and scroll down a bit there's a delete person option and so you would be able to delete that duplicate record if somebody has already changed it you won't be able to delete it and then in that case you just have to merge it so thank you for asking that question. And thanks, everybody. Loved your questions. Loved being with you today. Awesome. Well, that's about it. That concludes our question and answer session. Thanks again, everyone. And we hope you have a great day.